Well, good morning again. It's great to be with you this morning. I'm really glad that you're here. Good. That's good. It would be sad if it wasn't. Um, hey, before I go too far, I just want to share something with you. Last week, we, uh, we gave gift cards out to teachers. So if anybody was a teacher here, we gave them gift cards to, to Staples for 10 bucks as people were getting back into their school rhythm. And, you know, the average teacher spends about $200, I'm told, on their classroom getting it set up. And uh, then they try to maintain that throughout the year. So this in no way will meet all of that need. But uh, we had some left over. And we buy them from Staples strategically so that when we need copy paper or other office supplies, if we have leftover cards, we use them, right? So it's that kind of deal. Um, I-, I was thinking about getting them to Chipotle, but, you know, then we prayed about it. But here's what we like to do. We, we have put them together. We have about 25 left over this year. Um, we, were, we were really optimistic. And we put a uh, curiosity card that just says, this is our small way of saying you matter to Jesus and to us. And then we put a thank you note inside that is, has not been written on. And we would like to give those to the first 25 uh, kids or parents that have kids in, in, in public school. And we want to do it that way because we want... We want to empower our kids to go to the place in the public school that is absolutely the front lines of, of difficult. Public school teachers are so restricted in talking about Jesus, but they can talk about it if somebody else brings it up Amen. under the Constitution. So we want to empower our kids to go and take, the, take something that would inspire some curiosity and give it to their teacher. So they're back there. The host will know. They're at the connection desk. We have 25. There's no rain check on this. So the first 25, no pushing, no shoving, and wait until the end of service. But take one and give it to your kids and, and pray over it and ask them to give it to a teacher that is making a difference in their life or that they want to butter up for <laughs> exams, however that needs to go. We're wrapping up a series on our LifePoint guiding values. So we've been through all of the others and we get to this one. They're, they're not really in a particular order. These values came into being before the church came into existence. These values have been at play long before uh, this building or this property that we're on was ever a part of our, of our tribe's life. And, and the value today that we're wrapping up is kids count to God. Kids count to God, and they count to us. They count. Kids count. They matter. They always will. They always have. They forever will be important to the heart of God and to the heart of this church. And if you look around, you can see that there's a lot of kids around here. And we're preparing for a lot more. Kids count to God and they count to us. You know, if you're here today and you're, you're single or you're a teenager and you're like, oh, great, another non-applicable message for me. Well, in your future, you may have children. <laughs> or this may apply to the children that you raise in your mind when you walk through Walmart and you see people not parenting their children. <laughs> anyway. If you don't remember anything else I say today, I hope you'll remember this. I've shared it with you before. I think it's worth repeating. Parent now with later in mind. Parent now with later in mind. Hey, if you're in that group I just described, you don't have kids, and you're going, oh, good time for a nap, just change the word parent to live now with later in mind. Live now with later in mind. Because, see, I believe life is, there's an acronym that I use, life, living intentionally for eternity. And the lie of the enemy is that you should, live, you should live intentionally only about today and all the things you can accumulate and all the sin you can live in and hope that somehow you find a golden parachute like Enron tried to create. And you see where all their executives are now. Probably an antiquated illustration, but nonetheless, live intentionally for eternity. And if we live intentionally for eternity, we can parent now with later in mind. We can live now with later in mind. We can approach life today with eternity in mind. Parenting's hard, right? Parenting is hard. I mean, I don't think there's anything that is even in the same sphere 
fear of difficult as parenting. And this is coming from somebody who's passed kidney stones multiple times. There, there, there's nothing even in the same category as the responsibility that, that we have to raise up other human beings, right? When, when you're a parent, I think it's so easy to just get into survival mode, right? It's so easy to get into survival mode that we miss the mission mode of what it's really about intentionally. And so we're just trying to get through the day. So it's easy for us to turn on TV or hand them a screen or, or do whatever. And believe me, I, I get it. You know, before, we, before Melissa and I had kids, which by the way, today is 23 years. Can you believe that? 23 years. I don't know how I've done it. <laughs> she makes it easy. That's how I've done it. I don't know how she's done it. Before we had kids, I had two great theories on raising kids. And then we had two kids, and I have no great theories. <laughs> it's hard. And the hard thing about parenting is when you, when you start to gain and accumulate experience, they move out. About the time you think you're getting it figured out, they think they've got it figured out. And they leave you, and it's empty nest. So they tell me. I'm looking forward to seeing how I acclimate to that, but we'll see. We'll see how it comes. It's been a weird week for us. Friday, Rachel got her driver's permit for anybody over 40. They now call that their temps. So uh, yesterday, she and I drove around, and I prayed. <laughs> and then this week, we take Nathan to Nashville, so he'll start his freshman year of college at Trevecca Nazarene University. So we'll be dropping him off and not letting Rachel drive home, and I'll have a, a crate of Kleenex in the back for Melissa to make it. Parenting. Every stage, every place, every truth is this. Parenting is leadership, and it's responsibility, and it's stewardship, and it's intentionality. It's temporary. Parenting is temporary, and we are accountable. We're accountable. You are raising future adults. But really the question is, are you raising future Christ followers? Not rule followers, Christ followers. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 is uh, one of my favorite Proverbs. And I think it is incredibly, over the last several generations, it's been tremendously misunderstood. And it, and it says this, the proverb writer Solomon wrote this, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll, he will not turn from it. It's a proverb, not a promise, but the principle is this. Under, understand your child's uniqueness. You know, not every child's the same. And I'm going to unpack this verse briefly. Not every child's the same, Right? And if you try to have one-size-fits-all approach to parenting, I promise you, you are setting yourself up for difficulty. Amen. You're just making it harder than it needs to be because not all kids respond the same way, right? Has anybody parented a strong-willed child? <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you be found faithful. Parenting's hard, and not all kids are the same. James Dobson, a number of years ago, back in the 80s, wrote a book. And it entitled, Parenting Isn't for Cowards, and I agree. And he also wrote a book, Parenting the Strong-Willed Child, and I agree. You've got to parent strong-willed children. And if you try to parent a mild-mannered child like you parent a strong-willed child, or if you try to parent a strong-willed child like you parent a mild-mannered child, so if you have a mild-mannered child and that becomes the bar, and then you, you try to parent the strong-willed child to that low bar, you are creating a terrorist. Right? I mean, we can agree to that. But if you try to, if you try to parent a mild-mannered child to the bar that is necessary for a strong-willed child, they feel abused. Why? Because their bents are so different. Know your kids. Parent to the outcome that they love God with all their heart, 
transparent to the outcome that they're, they become adults who are productive members of society. Parent to the outcome, not to the exhaustion. Why is this verse misunderstood? Well, first, it's not a promise. Many, many modern commentators call it a promise. It's a proverb. It's a wise saying. It's a predictable truth that if you apply it, more times than not, this is the outcome. That's, that's the first misunderstanding. The second is this. The way it is translated doesn't really get to the heart of what it's saying. Train a child means to diligently impress upon them. Train. We'll see it again in another scripture in a few moments diligently impress it upon them, train them, be intentional, be engaged. If you've ever coached a sport with little kids, you know how intentional you have to get. And you know that many times you have to get right down on their level so they see your eyes and you're talking to them, not at them. Train them. And then we get to this phrase, which I think is really interesting how it's been translated. In the way he should go is literally translated in the Hebrew as according to his way. Train up a child according to their way. And what that is speaking to, and in the grammatical context of the Hebrew writing, which the Old Testament is written primarily in Hebrew, it means this. The grammatical context allows for two interpretations, and I think think it was written this way on purpose. One is model it well model it well. The other is, right, train them up in the way, show them that way. The other is understand their way of learning. Does that make sense? Some kids are oratory learners. Some kids are visual learners. Some kids mostly are kinesthetic learners. So figure out the bent of your child and do everything in your power to to match their bent to God's principles of truth and teach God's principles of truth through their bent of learning. And then when they're older, it's far more likely that those principles of truth stick and guide their life and heart, right? Right? Train up a child, Proverbs 22.6. That's a good one to memorize. It's a great one to understand the true interpretation. Because I think we take false hope in it sometimes as parents. That we, well, we brought them to church once a month. I thought that would fix them. Well, you lived with them a whole lot longer. They went to school a whole lot longer. I will say this. Churches don't get it right all the time. And we're no perfect church, but we are purposed. But you know why kids are leaving the church in droves? Because parents have acted like church was something you did instead of a Christ who was someone you followed. So don't blame the church. Don't blame the church. I'll die defending the bride of Christ, the church. Don't blame the church when you haven't lived it out through the week, when you haven't modeled through your life, when you haven't done the heavy lifting on purpose. And you know what? At the end of all that, our kids still have free will to make choices just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. So don't let the enemy bully you up with guilt. Do your best, be intentional, live intentionally for eternity, and train up your kids understanding their uniqueness. The second thing I'd say is this. Get your kids in front of Jesus early and often. Get them in front of Jesus early and often. Matthew chapter 19 is one of my favorite looks at the heart of Jesus. It's, it's incredible. I'm going to do my best not to get sidetracked here. You can make that a prayer request. <laughs> it seems so easy when we read it at first blush, but it is so incredibly deep when we dig in beneath the curtain of the context. So Jesus is being asked all these stumping questions, and they come to the end of the stumping questions of Jesus, and Matthew's kind of just logged a bunch of things about kids in in the last couple chapters here. And we get to verse 13 of chapter 19, and we read this. Then little children were brought. Would you say the word brought? Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuke those who brought them. So here's what's happening. We have three three primary people in the story so far. We have moms. Undoubtedly, moms were bringing the kids to Jesus. 
And, and moms had infants in their arms, and they had toddlers by the hands. If you ever travel with us to Guatemala or any other foreign country in a third world nation, here's what you see. Dads are somewhere trying to figure out how to feed their family all day long. And moms are wrangling kids like, like chicken herders. And they have, they have all their little kids, and the older kids are, are somewhere, either at school or also trying to find a, a way to feed the family. So if they're over seven or eight, they're starting to transition to being hunters and gatherers even at that time, right? And so you'll have a mom with a baby, probably nursing, and, and she'll have one or two kids wrangling, holding hands, and here comes a tribe of moms wanting to get their babies and their infants close to Jesus. And then, so we have moms, we have kids, and then we have bodyguards, I mean disciples. And, and it's always funny to me when the disciples take on a role they were never intended to play, and Jesus is constantly trying to gently correct them back to their true role. He's never had to do that with me. Yeah. Yeah, and if you believe that. So moms are bringing their babies. And what mom wouldn't want their baby in front of Jesus? They want his hands on their lives. You know why? He, they want his hands touching their bodies because those hands have healed disease and the pain went away. Those hands have touched eyes and the eyes were restored to sight. Those hands healed deaf people. Those hands touched paralytics in front of everybody and they walk out holding their mat. I mean, can you imagine these moms, what they've seen and what they've heard, and they've seen the paralyzed guy walking around before steroid injections, right? I mean, are you getting this? This is huge. Moms are bringing their babies to the most important man in the world at the time who is far more popular than the high priest of their structure. And then the, the bodyguards. Uh, sorry, uh, Jesus doesn't have time for kids today. Maybe next time we're in the area, right? That's how it, maybe you don't, you really should read the Bible a little more alive. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Jesus, I think it went down something like this. Probably like it went down in, when, when he was about to be, he was being arrested and uh, a couple of the disciples begin to brandish weapons. John tells us it was Peter. Luke tells us Jesus put the ear back on. But they were aiming at the head of the high priest servant, and they took off his ear, right? Matthew 26, you can read about it. Luke 22 and John 18 all tell the story. I think Jesus is looking at them now like he looked at them then, going, guys, stop it. It's not your place. That's not your role. Quit. Let me, here's the thing. Let me be God. So the moms press in. The disciples are humbled. Instruction from God normally humbles the servant. And Jesus begins, it's not like they got in a single file line. It's not, like, it's not like they all sat in a circle and he went around like duck, duck, goose as fast as he could just to get it over with. Check, 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 touched you, touched you. No, no, you're not getting a second touch. No, you've been in line before. He's interacting. He's getting his hands on the babies. He's holding the babies. He's hugging the moms. Tears are streaming down. The, the dust-stained faces of moms as Jesus is, is moving slowly through and interacting with these babies. And, and I'm going to tell you, I think one of the most incredible things we can do for our kids is to get them in front of Jesus early and get them there often and lift them to the throne in prayer and take them to things that elevate Jesus in your calendar because nothing should be more important in our calendar than our kids getting close to Jesus. I say that not because I'm a pastor. I say it because I believe it with my life, that Jesus changes everything. 
Everything we read in the Bible says Jesus changes stuff. Water to wine, death to life, infirmity to healing, brokenness brokenness to restoration. Jesus changes things. I want my kids to be in front of Jesus early and often. We dedicated our kids early, early in their life. I mean, within, within a week to 10 days of their birth, we were dedicated, and we dedicated them to Jesus. I mean, we did it formally in front of a body of believers then, but we've done it before that thousands of times, and since then, tens of thousands of times, because they're not our kids, they're his kids, and God wants us to get his kids home and in his presence often. The third, the third principle I would say that, that we, should, we should think about. One, know, know your children's uniqueness. Two, get your kids in front of Jesus early and often. And the third one is this, teach and model God's principles to your kids. Don't just teach them, model them. You, you know why I say model it? Because far more is caught in our life than what we teach with our life, with our words, right? If information were transformational, words would be enough. But we know information isn't transformational. And words are never enough. It's the sermon we preach with our life that that brings about the trust for authenticity of application by others. Not our words. It's our life. So teach and model. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is a pinning pinning, uh, portion of Scripture in the Jewish life. It's a pinning tenet of faith. Chapter 6, verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's known as the Mishnah. If you know Jewish people, you drop the word Mishnah, they'll be like, oh, nice, studied up. You can wow your Jewish friends. (laughs) Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. If you've been here any length of time, you're probably like, oh, back to that again. Yep, and I'll always be, oh, back to that again. Because if we'll get that together everything else falls in place. And then he goes on to verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. They're to be upon your hearts. Where are they to be upon? Hearts. They're to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Don't stop keeping this in the forefront, that we're to love God with everything, all our heart, all our soul, all our strength. Nothing should be an idol in the place of our God. Nothing should elevate in the place of our God. What, what, the, what the writer of Deuteronomy is saying, what, what is being conveyed here is this. It should be so infectious in you that it's natural that your kids find it as a regular topic of conversation. That loving God is a natural out expression of his impression that he's made through his spirit. His influence in our life should lead to the outfluence of our parenting. I know I'm making up words. Influence, outfluence, hang with me. What what God is doing in us, he should do through us into our kids' lives. Right? So it's important, not only that we understand their uniqueness, that we deal with our own junk. Because the stuff you don't deal with, you gladly pass down like unwanted heirlooms. Don't just understand their uniqueness. Deal with your stuff. Because if there's not authenticity, we paint Jesus as not being credible. Don't just get them in front of Jesus early and often. You're one of his kids. Get in front of Jesus. Get in front of Jesus. Stay with Jesus. Have a daily quiet time. Have a daily time in the Word and in prayer where you're seeking God and you're asking God to set the agenda for your day. 
I think we can define a hypocrite by somebody who has standards that they're unwilling to live by personally. Let's not only get them in front of Jesus, let's be in front of Jesus. And then let's model it with our life. And let's look for somebody who will model it into our life. I'm going to ask a really clarifying question. It's not in my notes. I'm pretty much out of those already. Um, It's going to be super awkward. I just want you to know. It's not lost on me how awkward this moment is about to be that you're unwillingly about to participate in. How many of you would say that I've inherited heirlooms of things from my parents I wish I hadn't that have held me back emotionally and as a parent? Thank you for being honest. I just want to pray right now before I go any further. Would you you mind to just lift your hand and say, God, I'm asking you to speak into that place. Heavenly Father, I pray right now for every hand that's raised where generations have spoke negativity, have spoke hurt, have spoke pain, have spoke heartache into our lives. I pray that you would speak healing and you would speak hope over the hurt. You would speak favor over the curse, that you would speak freedom over the brokenness. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would help us to make a decision today, even if our children are adults, to close the gap and to take authority over the pain and over the lies and not hand it on to another generation as much as as it depends on us. We will confront the lies with your truth and we will stand in the gap so that future generations may see you in the authenticity of your beauty, not merely through the brokenness of our pain. And just pray this to God. I invite you into that place. I invite you into that place. And maybe that's the biggest step that you'll make today. I invite you into that place. And for others, maybe, maybe you're at this, the point where you need to pray this. Help me to forgive them. Help me to forgive them. Help me to realize that brokenness gets passed down. It's not intentional. Help me to forgive them and to love them like you love them. In the name of Jesus. Hmm. I never want to parent my kids handing on the pain of the past. I never want the present to be derailed because of the past, and I never want the future. And this has been a journey for me, and I see many people wiping tears. Thank you for being authentic. If we can't be authentic in places like this, where can we be? If we can't be authentic in places where we talk about Jesus and the hope that he brings, where can we do that? So thank you. Thank you for leaning into that. And we want to parent now with later in mind. For a lot of us, that means we've got to confront our past with with the present truth. We've got to take authority over the baggage we've carried so that we can understand our kids' uniqueness and we're not just operating out of reaction. Amen? Kids count to God. They count to us. They count to us as a church. They're going to continue to count to us as a church. Let me share some exciting things that are happening. On September 18th, we will open the rest of this building. It's been a, so if you stood in a line last week in pouring down rain to check in your kids, if your kids stood outside in rain coming sideways to get into a porta potty because they don't have bathrooms on that side of the building currently, thank you. We understand the inconvenience. You live it. 
Thank you. But the exciting part is, on the 18th of September, we're opening that whole wing that's going down the hallway. Every toddler room has a bathroom connected. There are more bathrooms in that hallway. It is incredible. <laughs> bathrooms everywhere. So no longer will kids have to wait in line down the hallway. Do you remember when we were in the other room, when we were worshiping in the other auditorium, and you would hear the kids, and I would hear them from up front, and I'd say things like, man, it sounds like they're having a blast. Because they're going crazy in the hallway, all waiting to get in the bathroom due to our safe place policies, only a certain number of kids, no adults in there. Anyway, long story. But now there's bathrooms in every classroom that is for toddlers on up. And then we have nurseries that are going to be tailored to care for infants. Right now, they, the line checking them into our future office space right here was way out the door today. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for waiting, but it's coming to an end really soon. That's exciting. Um, it's exciting for the future. Kids count, not just infants, not just toddlers. I'm so excited for the teenagers to have a gymnasium that they can use with basketball hoops and volleyball nets and things they can use in the old auditorium we worshiped in for outreach again and to have a space that they can make their own in in some of the rooms that are sort of going to just be designated for them primarily and then we'll borrow them when we need to as adults right look if we don't care about this next generation who will who will who'll stand in the gap so we're going to care because they count we're going we're gonna to continue to create environments because they count. We're going to invest dollars because they count. We're going to we're gonna put together trips. Ben and I were working on, on a trip for, for the winter coming up, and I can't describe much of it to you because he would not be happy with me. But wh why are we doing that? Why are we putting in the effort and the time and trying to create environments where kids will encounter Jesus because they count? And we as a church want to supplement what you should be doing at home and get them in front of Jesus early and often. Amen? Amen? And then I want to talk to you a little bit about a transition that's happening in the Kids Point ministry. And that, that transition is a leadership transition that's taking place. Pastor Israel and his family are going to be moving on. They'll be with us through the 11th of September. Uh, we love Pastor Israel and Jen and their three children are, are precious, but they're moving on. And, and uh, we have a lot of love and respect mutually. We have a shared mission uh, to, to impact kids for eternity. And we're going to, we're going to miss them. But I, I hope that you will, while you see them, share your appreciation for what they've done for your kids and how he's been an incredible part of, of shepherding uh, our kids during this time. During the transition, I want you to know what we're doing. Uh, the advisory team has hired Melissa Coaches, my wife, who was the Kids Point director for seven years prior to Israel's coming, and Jen Jupp, who has been a ministry partner in that ministry for 10 years. And Jen is, uh, uh, they, they both have organizational history, but they also have huge hearts for kids. In the interim of the next six months, they're going to be stepping in, and they already are stepping beside and helping in the transition with Pastor Israel, giving vision, leadership, administration, guidance and direction to the ministry as we seek and pray for the next leader of that vital ministry. So will you pray for us and will you help your kids understand uh, at their level the transition that's happening? And I just commit to you that we're going forward in Kids Point Ministry with passion because kids count to God and they count to us, right? How many of you were here last week for the guard? How many of you really enjoyed last week? Yeah? Hey, how about that? I guess Bailey's going to have to start wearing silk shirts and blazers. <laughs> Can't wait for him to get back from vacation, and we'll have a whole new wardrobe for him and his team. <laughs> it was a great time with the Guardians and with Stan, and it was a great time together. And, and, and we, will, we will likely have different expressions of genres and styles from time to time because worship isn't about style, it's about Jesus and we, we enjoy getting in front of him in a variety of ways, right? With music and arts and different things. But let me tell you what happened last week. We had a number of people drive onto the parking lot and pull around and pull through because they couldn't find a place to park. Now, I know that we had a 
an incredibly large bus taking up six spaces, but at the end there were only two spaces left uh, altogether. And there was a torrential downpour. And I just want you to know, our safety team that, that is part of the parking team and different things, they are incredible incredible people. When you see them, will you thank them? They have a thankless job. When you get here and they're pointing you to the furthest parking spot, they didn't reserve it for you. <laughs> they're not doing it because they don't like you. It's not that they don't want to help. They're, they're trying to facilitate the in and out and the safety and the keeping everybody safe. And last week, they were soaking wet to the bone. In the winter, they freeze right? In the summer, they stand on hot asphalt. Will you be sure when you come in, just smile, wave at them. I know it feels a little bit like Disney World, and, and I'm always tempted to just break line, especially when I'm on a motorcycle like I may or may not have done today. But would you <laughs> smile and thank them? Here's what, here's what I know. Because of the capacity, like we asked you to scoot in, we've got to go to more services. We knew this would happen. We prayed it would happen, that God would help us to create a place where we care for more lost people, share truth with them, and we were covenanting and committing to get better at creating smaller environments for people to get closer to Jesus outside of rooms like this. We're not there yet. We're working on it, and you can help us. So October 2nd, we're going to go back to two services, 9, 15, and 11, 9, 15, and 11, and we'll, we'll be like we were before, two environments, all the building will be opened up. That comes with a lot of opportunities, exciting opportunities, exciting opportunities to be a Kids Point ministry partner. They're going to need more ministry partners in Kids Point with all those rooms and different things that are going to be happening. We're going to need more Kids Point ministry partners. If you're interested, you can check on the app. You can let us know through the app. You can, you can sign on and get information. We're going to need more safety personnel. If you're interested, you can let us know through the app. We'll get you to the contact person, and they'll, they'll touch base with you. We're, we're going to need more connection team people. We're going to need more people helping in the coffee ministry. You know, if, if, I could, if I don't show up, people don't get too nervous. But if coffee quit being produced here, there may be a revolt. But there's a variety of opportunities to, to be a part of the ministry here at LifePoint, and we would ask that you would pray about doing just that. As we wrap up today, don't forget that we have the gift cards for teachers. Don't forget that, uh, that there's a life group meeting next Sunday night, the 28th. If you're interested in leading a life group or you currently do, we'd invite you to be a part of that next Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Bailey and I will be here. We hope you'll join us leading or hosting. And let's not forget that kids matter, and God's watching, and he'll encourage us as we seek to, to direct our kids to his heart. Amen? Amen? Father, would you be with us today? Would you, would you help us as parents to be encouraged to love you with everything that we've got and to direct our kids to do the same by the, the life we live, the words we speak, the attitudes of our heart in the name of Jesus? Would you help us, Lord God, to move your kingdom forward in the next generation? Would you, would you stop the, the tremendous cliff where kids go to college and they, they graduate from Jesus never to return to the local church anymore? Across the country, we're seeing such a decline. Would you help us to, to be intentional, to to find ways to connect this culture to your heart at a younger and younger age? And would you help us as parents to make you the priority, not a priority, in our homes, in our jobs, most certainly in our parenting? Lord, would you help us to forgive ourselves for the areas that we've missed it? Would you help us to ask forgiveness of our kids if we, if we need to, to close the gap? And would you help us, Lord God, to trust you with our kids, to trust you 
and to get our kids in front of you early and to keep them in front of you often and to talk about you when we eat and when we sit down and when we walk along the road of life and, and to impress upon them to the best of our ability the true principles of God that will guard their heart and guide their life if they'll embrace you as their Savior, trust you as their Lord, and seek to live a life filled by your Spirit. Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for our community. May we be a healthy part of it, leading this community to Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen.